Hi, great to meet everyone. I'm super excited to be here today and to start my journey within the Hertz community. And another thing I'm really excited about is that biology is everywhere. It's on your skin, it's in your gut, it's in the plants you see around, in the food you eat, it's everywhere. And specifically, you have these really unique communities of microorganisms that don't only exist there, but actually evolve to survive and modulate the environment. And so this goes anywhere from like our physical and mental health to the taste of the food we eat and the ability of plants to resist stress. So, you know, as a bioengineer, the most interesting question to ask is like, okay, what can I do with this? Can I engineer these communities? And in order to engineer them, there are two different strategies. One of them is to just take one bacteria and put it inside the environment where it didn't evolve to be there. And a second one is to take genetic information and find ways to kind of transport it into the community. And dealing with that sort of strategy, the reasonable question to ask is, okay, so what happens to that genetic information that I'm adding to my community after I added it? Okay, we're dealing with things that are in the environment, not just in my controlled academic lab. And so apparently the answer is that bacteria constantly communicate through a process called lateral gene transfer, which basically means that just like you and I communicate with words, bacteria communicate with chemicals and with um, rushing around different pieces of genetic information. And to understand why this is actually really problematic from an engineering standpoint, just imagine that it's not a community of bacteria, but that you're interacting with a community of people, such as a company. So let's say, in terms of efficiency, if I have a message for the HR department and it ends up with some computer scientists working on engineering my new model, that thing is not going to get done. And the second thing is, in terms of safety or biosafety, if I want a message to get to the executive team, but it ends up with someone who entered my company only yesterday, that's gonna be a big problem for us. And so, in order to get efficient engineering of a microbiome, you need it to be um, selective over time. And that's what I tried to do in my master's thesis. So, we simplified the problem and we thought about it the following way. Within a microbiome, I have two species of communities that I care about. One is the species that should be able to express my genetic information and should be able to interpret my message. The second community is those that shouldn't be able to do that. Pretty simple, right? So we will call them the wanted and the unwanted host of my modification. And what happens throughout evolution is that bacteria accumulate changes and they learn to interpret um, the language of genetics differently, just like we have different languages in humans. And so what we try to do is to use the different data we can collect on those communities and find a way to automatically customize the genetic information we're introducing to those innate preferences that bacteria accumulated over time, to their own languages. And I will not go into the way we did that. It was a lot of super complicated biophysical models, which I love, but I really wanted to focus on the results of this research for this presentation. And the first one is, I'm a computational person, so we started with a computational analysis. And not to go into much, in too much depth, we just took the Rabidopsis taliana microbiome, and um, we tried to see how much we can optimize different sizes of microbiome. And we saw that the deoptimization with size plateaus pretty quickly, which means that even if we look at communities that are relatively complicated, we might still be able to engineer them in a way that is sustainable over time. And then the second part, which I am really excited about, is that we did this toy model where instead of dealing with communities, it was a really low resource sort of project. We just tried two model organisms and we tried to optimize expression and, and interpretation in one compared to the other. And we saw that one, we were able to create more than an order of magnitude of separation, which didn't exist previously with the uh, information we were trying to express. And the second one, is that that actually didn't impact the fitness, meaning that we, would still, we were still able to create this sort of evolutionary engine that was uh, conferring the selective expression we wanted over time. There is a lot to be done, 
mainly testing this in an actual environment. And I am very excited about the people who will be continuing my work. Um, and I want to thank the iGEM team, which started this uh, together with me. And you all for listening. Re uh, reversible switching in expression? Through what do you mean of, by reversible uh, switching? To, to make a change and then go back to, to induce a, change, a targeted change in a microbiome and then to, to revert according to... I don't think we're quite there yet at the moment. Uh, we don't even really understand how to make kill switches that actually work. And there's this trade-off between how complicated is the message that I'm giving. And so, I mean, the way to combat this right now would just to be giving like a really long cassette, mm -hmm. but that would break down in many different ways before you actually get to do that. Um, but I do think that there are ways that are mainly related to just figuring out the ecology, which is, I mean, Sherry is doing amazing work on that, um, which would pioneer that, and I'm exciting to see where those directions lead to. Thanks Thank you. That.